And I'm very grateful to say I learned from aesthetic realism that the purpose of love and the purpose of architecture are the same, to light the world. And learning this changed my life. To me, the world of Doric and Corinthian orders, pediments, and mathematical proportions once seemed in a different world from the one in which I was pleased, confused, and so often angry with women. To know that in the beauty of architecture is an answer to the questions of love, has given my life an integrity I once thought I would never have. In October 1978, I had the privilege of having an aesthetic realism lesson with Eli Siegel. At the time, I was a young man excessively concerned with my appearance, or as some might say, stuck on myself. <laughs> Mr. Siegel encouraged my mind to be deeper and wider. And he had surprising kind humor as he said, with a name like Romeo, I think you should change it to Higgins. <laughs> <laughs> it takes away from all that romantic stuff. <laughs> and then he asked me, do you know Palladio, the famous 16th century Italian architect? That may be a lovely name, Palladio Higgins. I see you sign your landscape with the name Palladio Higgins. <laughs> Palladio Higgins sounds both romantic and straightforward, and I fell in love with the name. After this lesson, I began to study the life and work of Andrea Palladio, and as I looked closely at one of his most influential and magnificent buildings, the Villa Rotunda, I was amazed to see what makes it beautiful, technically, says a great deal about what every person is hoping for in love. Mr. Siegel described it in this principle. All beauty is a making one of opposites, and the making one of opposites is what we are going after in ourselves. One, grandeur and modesty, a beginning point for liking the world. Palladio's Villa Rotunda, built between 1567 and 1569, is situated at the top of a hill on the outskirts of Vicenza, near Venice. It was commissioned by a retired Monsignor as his country home, and for entertaining, and it would have been easy for Palladio to create a palace glorifying its owner, rising imperiously above the surrounding landscape. But Palladio's purpose was to honor the wide world. In his now famous guide to the practice of architecture, I Quattro Libri della Architettura, he wrote of how the design of the Villa Rotunda was influenced by the beauty of the landscape. Quote, the site is as pleasant and as delightful as can be found because it is upon a small hill encompassed with the most pleasant risings which look like a very great theater, and all are cultivated and abound with the most exquisite vines. And therefore, as it enjoys from every part most beautiful views, there are logias made in the four fronts." This was very bold of Palladio. No architect had dared to design an entrance for a home that resembled the classical temples of ancient Greece and Rome. And on the Villa Rotunda, Palladio does this not once, but four times. The grandeur of these entrances impress the approaching visitor. You know as you enter this building that you're not going into any cozy exclusion from the world, which many couples feel as they drive up to their country home or close the door to their apartment. And once inside, the visitor is inspired to look out. Helen Gardner, in Art Through the Ages, writes of the logic within the design of the rotunda. Quote, its plan is both sensible and functional, as each of the porches could be used as a platform from which one can enjoy a different view of the surrounding landscape. This also makes the central dome-covered rotunda logical, since it functions as a kind of revolving platform from which the visitor can turn in any direction 
for the preferred view. The result is a building whose parts are functional and systematically related to one another, unquote. That is lovely. This grand building honors the world around it. Villa Rotunda faces the world on four sides, never turning its back to the surrounding countryside. Inside, the world in the form of sunlight enters from the dome at the top. And it is recorded that guests heard music played by moonlight in this central hall. One of the biggest things I learned from aesthetic realism is that we need to feel our most intimate moments are also wide. That when we are alone with the person we care for, the beautiful diversity of the world is not shunned. This is so different from the purpose I had. I made a woman into a substitute for the world, and everything depended on whether she liked me or not. If she did, nothing else mattered. I wanted to be the only thing on her mind. And if she didn't, I became furious or gross. In aesthetic realism consultations, I began to learn that my notion of love was really contempt, both for reality and for the woman, because in effect, I wanted her less real, less related to the world she was hoping to like. As this attitude was criticized and my purpose changed, I began to feel for the first time that true love was really possible. Two, surface and depth in architecture and women. In the lesson I quoted earlier, Mr. Siegel asked questions that related to things I had divided. For example, he asked, what is the thing most in common between a woman and <coughs> architecture? Now, I didn't know. Eli Siegel. Do you think most women are three-dimensional? <laughs> <laughs> Anthony Romeo hesitatingly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Eli Siegel. Do you think most buildings are three-dimensional? <laughs> Anthony Romeo, yes. <laughs> Eli Siegel. Do you want to see the full relation of the opposites of surface and depth? This was new to me. I had seen a woman as a pretty facade, and I hadn't been interested in the rooms within, in the depths of her mind. In fact, the depths of a woman made me uncomfortable. As soon as a girlfriend started talking about her plans, ambitions, or problems, I had the conscious feeling, why are you spoiling the moment by telling me about yourself? When are you going to talk about me? And once in Italy, I met a beautiful girl, and she was telling me about herself. I interrupted her to ask what she thought of my eyes. <laughs> I was really surprised when she turned and walked away. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> Today, as I try to understand the feelings of my dear wife, Karen Penatra, who is a poet and consultant of aesthetic realism, and our daughter, Alessandra. I feel I'm closer to all people. My interest in the world and architecture is wider and deeper. Three, pride and humility. The Villa Rotunda is built upon a platform, and an unbroken flight of 20 steps leads to those dignified, almost religious classical entrances. The building is proud, but it is also modest, and the way these two things are together is what makes it so beautiful. In 1567, as it was being built, Palladio lowered and flattened the high dome he had originally designed. Traditionally, the dome was the focal point of the building, and Palladio's drawing of the Villa Rotunda in the Quattro Libri, shown here, has the original higher dome. But I think Palladio came to feel, as the building went up, that the dome was not in keeping with the purpose of Villa Rotunda, to honor the surrounding landscape. <clears throat> when a lower, more modest dome was employed, the entrances became the focal point instead of the dome. If we look at Mayorworth Castle in Kent, England, 
which architect Colin Campbell designed after the Villa Rotunda. You see how different that high dome makes the whole building look. Mayworth Castle has dignity, but lacks the warm beauty of the Villa Rotunda. I think the relation of pride and humility was more deeply felt by Palladio. Every man can learn from the way pride and humility are one in the Villa Rotunda. Like many husbands, I've been overbearing at one moment and then acted like a confused leaf in the wind. Sometimes after feeling I need my wife very much, I've gotten annoyed by something she did and wanted to lay down the law. Villa Rotunda says no to this. Here, pride is at one with deeply felt humility, and this is how I want to be. The entrances which Palladio made so important are also a oneness of pride and humility. To walk up 20 steps is a humbling experience, but when you get to the top, you do feel proud. This grand stairway is flanked by walls, which seem both to thrust out assertively and to welcome, embrace. These walls join the base or plinth of the building in a way that makes for a strong horizontal line that runs around the Villa Rotunda, a visual contrast to the proud vertical thrust of the pediment. And very unexpectedly, on those most dignified aspect of the Villa Rotunda, those proud pediments, Palladio places life-size statues of classical figures in the most spontaneous, lively poses. Here, his sketches of these statues show they are unmistakably playful, and I think he wanted them that way, because in their liveliness, they criticize the imposingness of those entrances. When I first saw these statues, they disturbed me, because I thought they interfered with the dignity a classical building should have. I also felt, as many architects have, that the purity of a building was on a higher realm than people. <coughs> but as I studied the Villa Rotunda, I saw that those statues make that stern facade of the building warmer, more welcoming. It's as if Plaudio were announcing that this is a structure meant for people to have a good time in. Four, proportion in love and architecture. One of the reasons Palladio is so important is because of his theories about proportion, the science and art of relating different elements of a building. The Villa Rotunda is very large, 75 feet 5 inches high. By comparison, most four-story New York City brownstones are 55 or 60 feet high. But the way the building is proportioned, the way every part works together in scale with the whole, makes it seem friendly to a person, not overpowering. The grandeur of those entrances and the modesty of the dome work together. Palladio wrote, quote, beauty will result from the form and correspondence of the whole with respect to the several parts, of the parts with regard to each other, and of these again up to the whole, that the structure may appear an entire and complete body wherein each member agrees with the other, and all are necessary to comprise what you intend to form." Unquote. I learned from aesthetic realism that in true love, the different aspects of a person's life work together the way Palladio felt the parts of the building should. How different this is from the way I once used women not to care more for things, but to get away from the world and people. In Self and World, Mr. Siegel writes, Were the self to really get what it wants, its various phases or possibilities would be working as one, and what it was after as a whole would be working as one with all other things. How revolutionary this knowledge is, and what a difference it will make in the lives of people everywhere. It is a wonderful thing not to feel divided, not to feel you're in a different world at home and at work or at home with your wife, to feel in every aspect of our lives we can have the purpose of art, the purpose Palladio had as he built the Villa Rotunda. I love aesthetic realism for giving people the means through which love and art can be one. Oh.